Uh, okay, we have our guest speaker today, Philip Wallach, and he would uh, we're giving what him and he going to start now. Let's Philip. Okay. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you for having me and Izvinitsa Ya Nigavaru Paruski. Uh, but why? But why? <laughs> uh, I, it's, it's a hard language. And um, thank you to Nona for arranging arranging to invite me to speak with you all tonight. It's it's a it's a real pleasure. So um, this is a very good time to be talking about Congress because Congress is more exciting right now than almost any time in recent memory. Um, so let me try, is this going to work? I want to share my screen. Um, let's see. Yeah, look, looks great. Yeah. Beautiful. Okay. So I'm going to give uh roll to the chair. It's like you started. There we go. Okay, please everybody stop talking. Okay. Okay. So this is my book. I you can see a copy too. Happy um, maybe we need some people to mute so we don't get the echo. Yes, you have to mute. I, I, I'll mute. I'll mute. You, you talk, I'll start to mute everybody. Okay. Okay, thanks. So I, I published this book um, a few months ago. Um, it is a sort of a big picture book about what what the Congress is supposed to be doing in our in our constitutional system in the United States and uh, why why Congress has a lot of problems today. So uh, for this talk this evening, I'm going to uh, take us back through the events of this year to start. Uh, because they're they're really very interesting. Uh, then I'll sort of go back in time very quickly running through maybe a, a hundred years of 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 Congress's uh, history to give you a sense of why why things are so exciting um, right now and um, give, give you some historical perspective on that. Uh, and then I'm happy to talk uh, at the end and take questions then. Um, if I guess if anyone has really urgent clarifying questions uh, as I speak, don't you know, feel free to ask them, but maybe we'll hold most of the questions until the end. Uh, so uh, this was Kevin McCarthy when he finally won the speakership in, in January. Uh, it was, as, as you probably remember, uh, the first time the speakership was contested on the floor of the House uh, for 100 years. Usually, Parties um, have disagreements about who they would like to elect speaker, but they work them all out before the Congress convenes. They, they work them all out internally and they make a choice. And then all of their party members uh, or enough of their party members go along with the party's choice to just come in on the first day on, on January 3rd and elect a new speaker. The, the House has to organize itself from nothing, every, every new Congress. It, there's nothing carried over from the old Congress. It has to pick a new speaker, has to swear in all of its members who are all re, all elected uh, you know, every two years. And then it has to adopt new rules for proceedings. Uh, there's again, nothing carried over. So this time there was a big, a big struggle. It was extremely dramatic. Um, we had people practically coming to blows as they fought over whether McCarthy uh, was going to was going to uh, get through this is a this is a picture from the floor of the House of Representatives um, as things got very tense um, this man with the red tie is named Mike Rogers of Alabama <laughs> he is uh, the chairman of the House Armed Services Committee, and he was 
uh, spitting mad uh, over what was going on. Uh, this fellow in flexing his muscles there is is Representative Matt Gates of Florida. He represents the Panhandle uh, of of Florida, uh, right, sort of Tallahassee, the co coastal region uh, near Alabama, and. Uh, he, from the very beginning of, of this Congress, has sought to say that he that McCarthy should not be the speaker and that he's going to do everything in his power to cripple McCarthy's speakership or stop him from being elected. Uh, McCarthy was really having a hard time trying to convince this guy to go along. And the Republicans have a very narrow <clears throat> majority in the House of Representatives after the midterms. Uh, I believe... Uh, at, in January, the count was two, 222 to 212. <clears throat> so they just had a 10-seat 10, 10 majority. Um, that meant that it, if if they lost five of their members uh, and all the Democrats voted together, then they could not get a majority. Um, so... Uh, you know, eventually, how did this get resolved? Well, this woman here is Marjorie Taylor Greene of Georgia. She's sort of one of the most uh, uh, outspoken firebrands on the in the Republican side. Somebody who gave Republican leaders lots of headaches in the past, but she decided to support McCarthy. If you look at what her phone says there, I know it's very blurry. <coughs> Pardon me. That says DT. She got DT on the phone <clears throat> so that he could speak to Matt Gates on the House floor. And Trump said, this is very embarrassing for Republicans. They should get this over with. So they ended up over four days going through 15 rounds of voting. Um, you see, they needed needed to win uh, was 218. And McCarthy started out in the first round with just over 200. Hakeem Jeffries, the Democratic leader, now that Nancy Pelosi has st stepped down from being uh, in the leadership, uh, he got all the Democratic votes in every round. Uh, and so that was not enough. That's 212. That's not enough to make him the speaker, of course. Uh, but so here's, I'm going to run through the 15 rounds so you can see it was uh you know finally at the 12th round there was a big jump uh where a group of of republicans i think about a dozen of them who had been holding out made a deal ab about some of the ways that the house was going to work and commitments mccarthy made to them those were not public they were not written down and, and published uh those were negotiated behind closed doors but they, they made some kind of deal and they, they were then supporters of McCarthy from that point on. But there were still enough holdouts that he wasn't winning. Um, and we had to go all the way to the 15th round, at which point uh, six of the most strident critics of, of McCarthy, including Matt Gates, agreed that finally they would at least not vote. And uh, because you need a majority of those who vote for somebody, not a majority of the members, uh, that they're not voting was enough to allow McCarthy to win. So finally, on the fifteenth round, he did he did succeed in become becoming the Speaker of the House. Um, and so that was that was very dramatic, and it sort of wasn't entirely clear what he had promised to win this victory. Um, but a lot of a lot of what the critics were concerned about was that he was going to be too eager to cut deals with Democrats, especially on matters of spending. Um, with Joe Biden in the White House, Republicans are very eager to see spending cut. Uh, they, you know, and they believe that too much spending by the federal government in, in the last few years has has been a big cause of inflation. 
and that we need to cut back on spending. And, and they believed that McCarthy was not going to drive a hard enough bargain. And so they made him make some promises about that, the exact nature of which we are not privy to. Um, so let's fast forward a bit to the debt limit deal. Um, so for a long time, uh, so the debt limit is a strange feature of American politics. Um, you, sh you, you can all be forgiven if you don't quite understand why we have it, because it doesn't make very much sense. Uh, but the debt limit is a, is a statute, a, a law on the books that says a number. And beyond that number, the Department of the Treasury is not allowed to have debt outstanding more than that number. Uh, it's very cut and dry. Uh, it doesn't make much sense because Congress votes to approve spending and it votes basically to create the revenue laws we have in place. So Congress has approved deficit spending every year in recent memory, but it doesn't necessarily uh, automatically grant the Treasury the ability to do all the spending that it has approved. The debt ceiling has to be raised as a separate a separate vote. And uh, some people think that's useful because it allows us to sort of take stock of the big picture and say, hey, maybe we have too much debt here. Maybe we need to take a look at what we're doing. Maybe we need to have a correction here. So Republicans were indeed eager to have some kind of reduction in spending as a condition for raising the debt limit, which was which was needed because we were running up against it early in this year. So um, for a while, it was not clear what was going to happen because President Biden said that he would not negotiate. Uh, he, he just wanted to see the debt limit raised without any conditions. And uh, he wasn't willing to sort of try to move legislation without uh, Republicans. And he wasn't willing to negotiate. It wasn't really, he said, Republicans are not good faith bargaining partners because I don't think they're going to vote for anything that would raise the debt limit. And it's going to be their fault and they're going to crash crash the world economy by making the U.S. default. But it's going to be all their fault and I'm not going to work with them. That was his position for a while. Um, in the month of April, Republicans worked very hard to get their members together to vote for uh, a bill that included a debt ceiling increase. It was not a bill that had any serious chance of advancing in the Senate because it was pretty much a wish list of Republican priorities um, that, uh, that the Senate and President Biden were never going to be interested in. But they at least sort of established the principle, hey, we'll pass something with a debt limit raise, so President Biden, you better come negotiate with us. And eventually, President Biden decided he would do that. Uh, and once President Biden's negotiators got together with Kevin McCarthy's negotiators, they actually worked out a deal um, pretty quickly. I think it was a, a modest but sensible deal. And uh, it eventually would pass very overwhelmingly in both the House and the Senate. But there was a wrinkle uh, to this, which is that to bring important legislation to the floor of the House of Representatives, the, the usual way of, of doing it is to pass something called a special rule. And the special rule is passed out of the Rules Committee. The Rules Committee is um, maybe a little bit misleadingly named because its main work is to uh, control the agenda of the floor of the House of Representatives. And it's a little funny to call these special rules because this is the, this is sort of the normal way of of dealing with important legislation. And uh, under usual circumstances, the House Rules Committee in recent years has been intensely partisan. Um, it is constructed to give the majority party uh, 
a huge majority has nine members of the majority and only four members of the minority. There's no other committee in the House of Representatives that's similarly lopsided in, in its distribution. And it uh, usually just votes on party lines. Uh, but for this deal that Biden and McCarthy had worked out, uh, it actually only passed eight to uh, eight to no seven to six, seven to six through the rules committee. Um, because two of the Republicans voted against it, and then uh, there actually weren't going to be enough votes on the floor of the House amongst just Republicans to pass this rule. So even though it's as a as a matter of course, the usual convention is that. The majority party just votes yes on the rule and the minority party votes no on the rule. That's just sort of how things are usually done. In this case, that would have led to the rule failing and not taking up the compromise bill to pass. So what happened is that 52 Democrats in the end voted yes to get the rule through uh, and they were needed. They the Republicans would not have come close to passing the rule all by themselves. So that was highly unusual, um, and that was what was needed to get this bipartisan deal onto the floor. Once it was on the floor, it passed very comfortably, as you can see, 314 to 117. Uh, most, you know, more than two to one Republicans <coughs> voted in favor of it, and 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 maybe three to one Democrats voted for it. So it had very comfortable majority, um, but it was. Bit of a bit of a trick, tricky thing to have brought it to the floor. So that's what happened in in uh, April and May. We got this act signed into law, the Fiscal Responsibility Act, they called it. Okay, now let's fast forward to uh, close to the present time. We've been hearing about whether we were going to get a government shutdown starting yesterday, and it was looking like we were going to get a shutdown and now we, we didn't. So what happened? So um, the fiscal year of the federal government runs through September 30th. The new fiscal year starts on October 1st. So we need new spending bills passed to cover the new fiscal year. Uh, but in standard practice, Congress likes to give itself extra time. And at the beginning of the fiscal years, it often passes these things called continuing resolutions a C CR, which just keeps in place the spending levels from the past year and um, and allows them to continue uh, while they continue negotiating the sort of fully detailed spending bills for the fisc for the new fiscal year. So an overwhelming majority of members in both parties wanted to just pass one of these continuing resolutions to allow themselves more time to keep negotiating. Why is it so hard to just do that then? Why did we look like we were gonna have a, a shutdown? Well, it's because some of the members of the Republican party said that they're sick of these deals with the Democrats. They don't wanna see any more deals with the Democrats. They don't wanna see a, a continuing resolution passed. Uh, they wanna to see tough spending bills passed that will cut down on spending and if and if McCarthy was going to make a deal with Democrats again, they would be taking action to try to uh, try to oust him from the speakership, try to knock him out. Uh, so McCarthy had a, a conundrum. He could work with Democrats to bring a, a continuing resolution to the floor and avoid a shutdown, but in doing so, he would anger some members of his own party, um, possibly endangering his own job. Um, and nevertheless, at the last minute, he decided that's what he would do, right? On, on Saturday, he uh, decided to allow this bill to come to the floor in an unusual way. It bypassed the Rules Committee. I don't want to get too into the arcane details here, but an alternative way, instead of getting a rule from the Rules Committee, you can suspend the rules. You can say, 
if almost everyone agrees on something, we can just sort of put aside all of the procedural constraints and get straight to voting on a bill. That's called suspension of the rules. And that's how this bill came to the floor. Um, uh, members from both parties decided to suspend the rules, a bipartisan coalition, and they passed it very easily. You can see 335 to 91. Uh, and then the Senate passed it 88 to 9, and Biden signed it. So we didn't get a shutdown. We have 45 days on this continuing resolution. So it's important to note, we didn't actually resolve any of the big spending fights for the year. We still have to resolve those by the middle of November now. Um, maybe we'll do more continuing resolutions. That's often the case, pushing things to December. Uh, everyone really wants to take a Christmas vacation, so that's what, what acts as a real uh, a real constraint on them. Uh, but that's where we are today. So um, I'll come back. I'll, okay, <clears throat> so that sort of takes us up to the present moment. But why are we having these struggles at all? Um, what is happening in the House of Representatives? Why? Why are these members angry at McCarthy? Why, what what do they envision the House looking like um, different than it has been in the recent past? So now I'm going to zoom out and give you some sort of big picture perspective from my from my book. Uh, so this metaphor I use in my book is a, a pendulum. <clears throat> um, over the long history in, in Congress, we see both chambers, especially the House of Representatives, though, um, they sort of shift over time very gradually um, from, from being more open to rank and file members making things happen or, or less senior members trying to make things happen to being uh, more tightly controlled by the top leaders in the chamber. Um, so I'll try to make that more concrete to to uh, to make it make more sense. So um, this is a political cartoon from, and I believe it's from 1908. Um, this is this is my favorite picture from my book. I really love this cartoon. Uh, the the gentleman pictured is named Joseph Gurney Cannon. He was one of the most powerful speakers of the House in in the history of of America. Um, and the way that this political cartoonist has showed things, this is Cannon presiding over the chamber, and all of the other members out in the audience are also Joseph Cannon. The idea is that he was such a domineering figure at this time in, in the history of the House that people, and especially his critics, felt that what, what had become of the House was it had just become sort of one man's, one man's judgments ruling the place. And of course, that sits rather uneasily with the idea of a representative body with 435 members who come from all over the country and bring very different perspectives depending on their constituencies, uh, different geography that they come from, different kinds of economic interests from their districts. We think uh, the argument in my book, at least, is that the House ought to be a place where lots of different opinions uh, get aired out, lots of different values get brought together. And so if the place gets so dominated by its top figures that it seems like it's just one voice uh, sounding, and people are bound to get frustrated with that. They're bound to think uh, that this is kind of a rigid orthodoxy and, uh, and this needs to be broken up. So Cannon was sort of an apex of control for, for the leadership. He was known as... Uh, boss canon um, and eventually members of his own party uh, decided to break against him and bring him down. So in 1910, there was sort of one of the most important moments in the history of the House of Representatives, a bunch of progressive Republicans 
joined with Democrats to to break the control that Joseph Cannon had been exercising. And the way he actually had had done it was that he was not only the Speaker of the House, he was also the chairman of the Rules Committee at that time. And they managed to throw him off the Rules Committee and make the Rules Committee a much more uh, decentralized body that actually uh, was drawn from, elected from the whole membership of the House. That started to mean that things could get on the agenda, even if Cannon did not like them. <clears throat> you started to see things open up. And more importantly, Cannon lost in the next election uh, in, in 1910. Democrats took control of, of the House. <clears throat> we entered into a, a long time period where because of this sense that we did not want the speaker to be just ruling over the place in an imperious, you know, czar-like manner, uh, we had instead a principle that um, the most senior members of the chamber would get to be the chairman of the committees. No questions asked. If you were the most senior members, you got to pick your committee chairmanship and you could keep it forever as long as you uh, had a heartbeat. And so uh, you had these committee chairmen who were in fact the most powerful actors in Washington for many decades. Uh, so that meant there were many power centers, uh, and that made for a very different style of politics than when you just had uh, a domineering congressional leadership. Um, so that sort of, I'm not going to go into very much detail, uh, obviously, that's sort of the main picture. Um, you have some signs uh, of things changing. This is a picture of Lyndon Johnson. Uh, who, of course, was the Senate majority leader in the in the mid and late uh, 19, 1950s, before he became the vice president and then the president of the United States. Johnson was a famously uh, a bully, um, trying to use the Senate, the top Senate leader job, to uh, push his colleagues around. He was he was pretty good at bullying people. Um, but um, but we shouldn't have the idea that 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 he was all that good at sort of dictating exactly what happened. It was still a place dominated by its chairman, um, and uh, this fellow on the left of this picture is named uh, Richard Russell. He was for a long time uh, one of the most powerful senators. He was the chairman of the Senate Armed Services Committee sort of one of the most influential actors in, in setting America's foreign policy. He was also a staunch defender of segregation in the South. And that was a, a common theme, is that a lot of these members who were most senior were, uh, were Southerners, because, of course, the South back then was essentially a one-party state. They were all one-party states, the Democratic Party. It was sort of a century long hangover of the Civil War is that Republicans were not competitive in the South. Um, Lincoln's party was not welcome. So the Democrats uh, were the dominant party. They tended to be very conservative uh, in all or in many kinds of ways, not not in every way. Um, but the story of how we get to the Congress we have today sort of starts with the fact that these southern these southern conservatives were very powerful and and that caused a lot of frustrations um so these these three men are sort of the leaders most responsible for passing the civil rights act of 1964 uh, which which is of course a very important moment in the history of congress that's when the southern the southerners sort of took a grand stand. They made a, a grand filibuster that lasted 75 days. Uh, they eventually lost. Uh, and we passed the Civil Rights Act. That was a big deal. So that was a bipartisan enactment. The gentleman on the left is Everett Dirksen, a Republican leader from Illinois. 
The guy in the middle is Hubert Humphrey of Minnesota. The guy on the right is Johnson's successor as Senate Majority Leader. His name was Mike Mansfield, Montana. Uh, the Senate worked in a very collegial way in, in the, during this time to sort of bring in as many people as, as possible into the coalition to pass civil rights. I have a whole story in my book about that. I'd be happy to talk about it if people are interested. But uh, they man, you know, they managed to get that through, and that sort of started to break the logjam, break break open the, the way that things had operated. And they passed a lot of legislation for Lyndon Johnson as president. Uh, it was a very active time in Congress, but in spite of the fact that they were passing a lot, the sort of rising generation of young liberals wanted more. Um, and sort of this urban liberals were uh, sort of the rising force um, let's, so in the 1970s. Um, so they managed to start overthrowing the power of these chairmen uh, and to decentralize power in the 1970s not just from the leaders, but all the way down to sort of more junior membership. Um, Congress changed a lot in the 1970s. It practically doubled its, its staff size. Um, and it went from, uh, the subcommittees became a place of a lot of action. They, did, they were sort of very excited about um, government oversight. Of course, this was the, t the era of the Vietnam War, which Americans were very uh, upset about. There was a lot of distrust of of the government under President Johnson and then on President Nixon. Of course, then we got Watergate, where Congress was on the verge of, of throwing the president out of office. So Congress is sort of generating a lot of energy um, during this time. This gentleman pictured here is named Phil Burton. He was a member from San Francisco. Um, one, of, one of the people sort of responsible for going after the old Southerners. Uh, he actually held the seat that Nancy Pelosi uh, now holds today. Um, and so we have to take stock of this moment in the 70s was so important because it really things were changing but congress was not actually doing a great job passing legislation in many ways by the end of the decade especially so the jim jimmy carter is president from 1977 to 1980 he has huge huge democratic majorities after you know that's in the wake of watergate republicans were in really bad shape Carter had these huge Democratic majorities, but they weren't very good at actually passing his agenda. So there were a lot of frustrations with this decentralized model of Congress. And so the story of the 80s through the 90s that my, that my book tells is a turn toward centralization. So we have um, in, the, in the 80s, these two important Democratic leaders, Tip O'Neill, on the left there, and uh, Jim Wright, who was the speaker from 1987 to 1989, uh, they they both they both sort of said enough enough with the chairman chairman work for me. I'm going to get the Democratic agenda passed. I'm going to go toe to toe with Ronald Reagan, as he's the president, and uh, I'm going to sort of get the team all on one page. And they took all sorts of procedural measures to centralize power once again. Uh, and some people felt, some people even in the Democratic Party felt that they were, right was becoming rather tyrannical in the way he was running things. Republicans also broadcast that message loud and clear. So on the right there is Newt Gingrich who became famous for sort of talking about what a corrupt institution Congress was and specifically going after Jim Wright as corrupt and eventually chasing him out of office. He resigned from office in 1989 after an ethics ethics committee inquiry that, that Gingrich had initiated. So 
that sort of made Gingrich a big star on the right. And uh, fast forwarding just a little bit, of course, he helped Republicans take control of Congress after the 1994 midterm election. Um, Gingrich really loathed Congress. He, he had sort of made his whole career talking about what an awful place it was. He didn't really have much of a sense for how a legislature works. He He's somebody who, you know, he's a PhD historian. He likes sort of the grand, the grand march of history. He likes to talk about Napoleon and uh, probably Alexander the Great for that matter. He, he thought of himself as a, a world historical figure. And in many places, in many ways, that's not, that's not a natural temperament for a, a legislative leader to have. Legislative leaders need to do a lot of coaxing and wheedling and getting people together. They, they need to be cautious in figuring out exactly what their coalition will support. But Gingrich was anything but cautious. He had a lot of sort of grand confrontations with Bill Clinton when he was president. And I would say for the most part, um, those did not go so well for Republicans because Gingrich was not always very realistic about what what Republicans were willing to go uh, to go to the mat for. But so we had this centralized model of leadership under Gingrich that his successor, Dennis Hastert, supported very much. And then Democrats stepped into it very naturally. Uh, here's a political cartoon from from 2010. Uh, you know, Nancy Pelosi came into the speakership in 2007. And as this cartoon says, she was very good at twisting arms. She was a she was a very feared feared figure in Washington for many years now. Uh, her members did not like to mess with her. They they thought of her as sort of the boss, and uh, she was very good at what she did. She helped Barack Obama pass a lot of very ambitious legislation with basically no Republican support at all in 2009 and 2010. Uh, so, and then, you know, when she came back into the leadership in, in 2019, in the middle of the Trump administration, she became speaker once again after nearly a decade uh, of Republican control. She, again, was this very top-down dominating model. Um, that's what we've been familiar with for a while now, for decades is a sort of very top-down leadership. Um, so this cartoon sort of gets to the point that we started the story at back back in 2023. So uh, I think a lot of people had the sense that Kevin McCarthy was coming in with a very unruly bunch of Republicans that he was expected to preside over combined with this very narrow majority. And uh, there was a sense that he just would not be able to do what Nancy Pelosi had done. Even if he wanted to operate in that intense tap-down manner, it just wasn't going to happen for him. And frankly, he's not, he's not, uh, his personality is not that way. He's known as a very genial person. Back when he was a state legislator in California, it was somebody who got along with Democrats, figured out how to have an influence, even though he was a in, in a you know a very, very much a minority party. Uh, so he's somebody who's um, made a lot of friends and got found his way to the top of his party. Uh, but there's this sense that he just can't dictate things because his his conference, the Republican conference today, is is not not unified enough uh, to get behind him and allow him to rule with an iron fist. Uh, so we find ourselves where McCarthy is trying to make something work. Um, he's now experiencing this backlash. And, uh, you know, basically he doesn't have enough Republican votes to pass things through because there's been, along with Gates, a handful of other members who don't want to support what he's doing. Uh, and uh, 
that means he pretty much has to work with Democrats. But Gates and some of these others say that if you work with Democrats, that's a betrayal of everything it means to be a conservative in this moment in 2023. We can't work with the enemy. We have to take the fight to them all the time. Um, so Gates now says, you've worked with Democrats one too many times. I'm going to bring the motion. And uh, that's the news this evening. He has, in the 7 o'clock hour this evening, before we got on this call, uh, he, he made this motion on the floor of the House of Representatives. Um, the way it works is that it doesn't have to be considered for two legislative days. Uh, they can, which is a little bit different than a calendar day. But sometime in this week, uh, we have to dispose of this motion. He's brought this parliamentary maneuver that's meant to force McCarthy out of out of the speaker's chair. Um, and I can go into exactly sort of how this is likely to play out if people want to hear that. But uh, I think it's important to ask, do the people who want to get rid of McCarthy actually have a different vision for how Congress ought to work? Does this relate to some bigger vision of sort of what they want to see in American politics? Or are they just um, acting out some sort of personal enmity for McCarthy for some reason? Um, uh, so sometimes they do make some principled sounding arguments and say they want Congress to be a more open place where more people have a chance to have their say. They want to work things through committees more, what's called regular order. They want to see things considered in cons in committee thoroughly and have a chance for committee members to offer amendments on bills before the committee votes on it, and then people not on the committee to offer amendments on the floor of the House. That doesn't happen so much today. Uh, so they say they want more, more chances to actually affect legislation. They also say, going back to these promises that Kevin McCarthy made in January that, that McCarthy has has violated these promises. Again, we don't know exactly what these promises were, and they're not giving a lot of details, but they say promises have been broken. That's not just one member saying that. It's quite, quite a few members saying that. Uh, at the same time, it has to be said that some of these members do not seem interested in legislating at all. They seem interested in making a lot of speeches and getting a lot of attention and going on Fox News and getting a lot of eyeballs, and they can raise a lot of money by doing this. Um, these, these members especially are good at raising money from small dollar donors all around the country. You know, Many tens of thousands of people will give them $10, $15, $25, and enough of these people are giving these kinds of contributions that they start to raise serious serious millions of dollars in this way. That makes them uh, somewhat powerful within the House. Uh, it gives them a sense that what they're doing is, is working in some way, even if they're not actually able to pass anything. Uh, there's, there's some sense that what's rewarded in American politics today is just this performance of opposition, this denunciation of the establishment over and over and over again. Uh, and so in some ways, McCarthy working with Democrats gives these people what they want most, which is somebody to denounce uh, and to fundraise off of, to say, we're not like these sellouts uh, in the leadership. We're, we're the true principled people who fight, fight, fight. Um, it's hard to say exactly where we go from here, um, but I think this idea that we're now we're now swinging the pendulum away from tight leadership control, for better or for worse. Um, I think there's definitely a possibility that that leaves us in sort of a, a a situation where things are less manageable. That it's it's sort of even keeping the lights on starts to seem like an ordeal, which is what we have ahead of us in the in the months to come. Um, but uh, but there may be some benefits to it because I think there's also a sense that we're kind of exhausted by by the, the 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 way that our leaders have been running things in recent years and maybe there is a sense of a need to break things open and and have some more 
freewheeling debates that lead to unexpected things. Congress has been a very boring place uh, up until this year. It's sort of Republicans and Democrats line up against each other very predictably. Uh, and there's not usually a lot of excitement because everyone just sort of march follows marching orders. Whatever you can say about what's going on now, it, it is a lot more exciting. Um, and perhaps can lead to sort of interesting things in terms of legislating. That remains to be seen, though. We, we don't have a lot of evidence of that yet. So that's the end of my slideshow. Uh, I will stop sharing my screen. So there we go. Can you see me now? Or I see I see I see Lev Levitin. Yeah, we see you, we see you and hear you. Okay. okay, good. Um, so that's my presentation. Uh and I'm happy to take questions of, of all kinds. We can talk about history, we can talk about the Senate, which I know I didn't say very much about in my talk. We can talk about what's likely to happen in the present, in, anything that people <coughs> people are interested in. So uh, I don't know. Should I call on people, or will, will you uh, will you help help do that? Whatever you prefer, you can do this. I can do this. I see Igor Yudovich was the first one. So okay, let's go to him. Mm -hmm. Igor. Okay, uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, you know, I understand problem with Congress just from big numbers. In first Congress in seventeen. 89, it was only 59 people. Right now we have 435. It's not easy to manage 435 in any corporation, but especially when it's people, each of them think about himself as the best in the world. It's very, very opportunistic and very ambition people. So, but always in our history, I said almost always in our history, uh, in Congress, in the Senate, were some group or some people who, after all this squirrel, after all this different opinion and, and, and so on, in last moment, they sit down with opposite people drink whiskey, maybe uh, smoke cigars, and for five, 10, 12 hours made some deal. It always was like this. Last person in my experience here in America, it was Edward Kennedy, who wasn't a good person, but who always could find, find some very important guys on the other side and make a deal. So my question is, you see, right now, anyone in Republican Party, in Democratic Party, who actually can forget all this fighting and serve American people in a way American people vote for them to make some registration, to have some agenda, to make American people life better, and so on. Right now, I see only fighting, 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 and I don't, I do not blame Republican right now, because we all see what the Democratic Party was in the last ten years with Pelosi. Uh, Pelosi was very authoritarian, like you said. And all 100% democratic part of Congress uh, vote as one group, 100%. Question is, do you see any people right now who can be leader in Congress and Senate in future to make some, I will not say freedom ship, but deal to advance agenda. Thank you. Okay, it's a very good question. Uh, I'm glad you brought up Senator 
Kennedy. Um, what's important about Kennedy is he was known as a very strong partisan, right? He he was a left liberal. There was no question that he was going to be, uh, you know, always a very uh, left person. But he was he was interested in making deals. He was interested in making things happen, and he was good at it. Uh, you know, people on the other side of the aisle, they might not think he was a good person. They might think he was kind of an arrogant guy, but they knew that they could work with him. And of course, certainly, you know, John McCain was like that as well. Uh, and K McCain and Kennedy famously liked to work. Yes, together. together. Um, and so that's an important thing to, to realize is that someone can be a very strong partisan, but still believe in this idea of making the deals to make things happen for the American people, still finding ways of even though you're my adversary and I'm, you're still going to be my adversary, I'm going to find the common ground on this important issue that's facing us today. And so that's that's really the engine of American government, as you say, is this willingness to say, we're not going to agree on everything, but we have something to agree on right now to help the country. So you've really hit the nail on the head. And um, I don't think that we're without people like that today. I think if you look at the last Congress before the 2022 uh, midterm, there were quite a few good things, deals made that that got a lot of bipartisan support. They usually started in the Senate. We had this Joe, Joe Manchin in the Senate finding mm -hmm. Republican partners to work with. Um, and he did that on the infrastructure bill and uh, even a gun gun control uh, bill and uh, this CHIPS Act, which was a sort of a science science and semiconductor promotion, a big important law. And we, we could talk about whether these are good laws or bad laws, but they, they had this deal-making spirit. So it's not totally absent from that. See, and I think to Joe Biden's credit, he was good at letting these things happen and not getting in the way of them and mucking them up. Uh, that's that's not the easiest skill always in, in the current political moment. So I, I give him a little bit of credit for that. But um, in the current Congress, it's just not so not so clear where the deal making comes from. I mean, Republicans in the House are in such disarray, I would say, and there's such a. Uh, lack of clarity about whether they can just work with Democrats and try to figure out what they could all, you know, what most of the Republicans and most of the Democrats could d agree on, because that that has been branded as some kind of betrayal. And certainly President Trump uh, is out there making noises about what a betrayal that would be and how Republicans need to fight, fight, fight and never make deals with these evil people. Uh, so, I mean, you know, Trump is definitely a big part of the political culture in the, in the present, but I, I wouldn't lay it all on his feet. I would say we had this, this sort of animosity growing and growing before he ever came on the scene. So I do think we have some, some people, um, you know, there's a generational problem also right now. I think we, so. Yeah, we have very, very old leaders. So, you know, Pelosi and Hoyer, Got out and Clyburn, they were the sort of three top leaders for Democrats in the House, and they stepped aside. That's very interesting. Um, it's sort of not, I don't know exactly what kind of leaders their successors will be. This New Yorker, uh, Hakeem Jeffries, is now the Democratic leader. He's, I don't know, 47 years old or something, a different generation. Republicans have, you know, McCarthy is not so old himself. So that's uh, in the House, but the Senate is still dominated by Mitch McConnell on the Republican side, and he's he's 80 years old and and having a lot of struggles, obviously, with his health. So I I think I I would like to hope that the new generation has some interesting 
potential. You know, there's the Senator J.D. Vance from Ohio. Uh, uh-huh. He's a very big admirer of Trump. That's what he's most famous for is how lavish in his praise of Trump he is. But he's actually come in to the Senate and sort of looked for ways that he could work with Democrats. Uh, he's trying to pass a railroad safety law in the Senate right now. And I would say the chances are pretty good that they might pass it out of the Senate because of this railroad accident that happened in Ohio. So that's that's interesting. Uh, he's interested in working with Elizabeth Warren on on certain kinds of things because he wants to fight the big tech companies in America. And so does she. You know, that's interesting. I don't know that I will like the legislation they come up with. I would guess no. But I like to see that kind of strange bedfellows in politics. That's a healthy, that's the sign of a healthy political culture. So to me, I, I like to see that uh, from a process point of view. And so I don't think, I don't think it's hopeless. And because these are ambitious people, as you said, they really shouldn't be satisfied with just sitting around waiting for the leaders to tell them what to do. Madison says the engine of our checks and balances in America is ambition counteracting ambition. That's yes. supposed to be the engine of how the legislature keeps the executive branch honest. It hasn't really worked, been working so well if, if everyone wants to march in line behind the president. Uh, and certainly Pelosi, for all that she was in a sort of a authoritarian in her tendencies, as, as you put it, she was a very loyal partisan. She she never sort of was at cross purposes with Barack Obama. She figured out how to be on the same page with him and, and same with Joe Biden. So uh, I think it would be healthy if, if we had more ambitious people in Congress sticking up for their own institution and, and finding out what it could do not always just uh, marching behind its leaders or marching behind the president. So I, I think there are some good signs, but uh, but we'll see. Uh, it is it is not a political moment that invites a lot of optimism. I will I will I will be the first to concede that. So anyway, let's go to the next somebody else. Okay, thank you. Question. Thank you for your question. Zeus, Zeus, please. Yes. Uh, thank you. My name is Zeus uh, Weyman, and uh, my question is. Uh, uh, during your talk, especially in uh, in the end, uh, you used uh, the term "our leaders," and uh, uh, my question is uh, whether in your book such a, a relatively new term appears, uh, and what's your attitude to it, uh, like "una party" in America? And uh, uh, the second small question, if you look to antiquity, um, would you compare America to Rome or Carthage? What's your take on it? Thank you. Well, uh, so I wasn't entirely sure about your first question. There's, you threw out this word uniparty. Uh, th this is this is language that Gates likes to use. Representative Gates, who's trying to throw McCarthy out, and this this is sort of the idea that that the leaders from both of our parties are 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 finding ways to sell out the American people all the time. Uh, and we need we need some very different kinds of leaders like like Trump is certainly defined himself in opposition to the establishment from the beginning. Maybe Robert Kennedy Jr. defines himself in opposition to this what he sees as this corrupt establishment serving serving big business in all kinds of ways. Um, I'm not at all sympathetic to this view myself. I, I think our parties do have very big differences. Uh, I, I, I don't think that they're always just eager to serve our corporations. Um, I think there is a problem with certain debates getting stifled that we don't actually have, have it out with each other. So on an issue like Ukraine, for example, um, it's kind of amazing just how big of a commitment our country has made to Ukraine without having really a proper debate about it 
on the floor of Congress. Uh, and certainly someone like Gates is very upset about that. And I have some amount of sympathy to him when he says, we're not even debating these things. We're, we're just voting them through on the strength of deals between our leaders. And, uh, and what are we doing? You know, what is it all for? What, what are we expending American dollars on and, and possibly American lives someday? So I, I think I think it is true that the way that we've run Congress does not let us have these big debates so it's that people can feel like they've had their chance to have their say. Um, so that's what I'll say about that question. Uh, now, is America more like Rome or Carthage? Um, I have to say, I don't know much about the government of Carthage. I think the interesting question for me is about the Roman Republic becoming an empire going to become a Roman Empire. Uh, in the history of Rome, you you had this, you never actually stopped having the Roman Senate. All throughout the history of the Roman Empire, the Roman Senate was still the lawmaking body. And formally speaking, the emperor had to defer to the Senate. It was just, in fact, everyone knew that the Senate would do exactly what the emperor wanted all the time. And uh, and so I do uh, I do from time to time when I'm waxing uh, large in my in my imagination ask myself about whether America is sort of gradually moving toward that model where of course we're going to always have our Congress it's not just going to disappear but. Does Congress just become a rubber stamp for what the president wants to do? And ultimately, do we end up having a kind of elected elected emperor in this country? Um, and what, what what will that do to the nature of, of American politics and American society if, if we have sort of this ideals of American self-government and everything that entails and Republican government, but in, in fact, we have something much more like an imperial system with with a with an elected um, emperor. Uh, I think I, that's that's a real concern for me, um, and part of why I'm so interested in getting Congress to work better is because I see Congress as really the necessary the necessary element uh, to to embody self government in in America's federal government. So to me, the stakes are very high there, and I don't think it's inappropriate to think in those big sweeping terms. Um, yeah, that, that's that's my answer. I hope it, I hope that satisfies you. Thank okay. you, Alec Kaminsky. Alec. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, my question more uh, ideological, not ideological, more philosophical. So uh, from your presentation, I got to conclusion that uh, you think that not everything is going is going good or as going as let's go back to centuries uh, as our founding fathers uh, had in mind how it would go. Uh, just just uh, did I get it correctly? First of all, yes. For sure. So, uh, so you writing book, spending your time and uh, and your effort to uh, find solution to to the problems that you see. Uh, first, I I didn't get exactly uh, what you see as a problem because in order to fix something, first of all, we need to understand. Yes. What, what is broken and uh, also if uh, the whole system is a good idea so uh, it should be self self-correcting to, to some extent so if there are some uh, bad apples uh, get to power then uh, it should be uh, like in in mass there is a notion of stability so the system must be self-corrected and uh, self-improving to some extent to, to, to get to some kind of progress. So what is your, your view 
from the historical perspective uh, of our country for two centuries. Uh, what are the real reasons why did we get to to the state of affairs that we have uh, that we have today, and by those uh, things that, for example, I see as the biggest problem uh, for our present and for our future is that uh, the idea of of America as of absolutely free people without without censorship. Uh, with a very, very limited government that doesn't uh, take care of pretty much anything uh, other than uh, enforcing the law and uh, and supporting the God-given freedoms and rights. We, we came to the situation when we have governments that take trying to keep, take care of everything, uh, like uh, government now of, uh, takes care about uh, health care. The government take, takes care about our finances, of our social security, uh, education. education. Uh, and uh, for that reason, it it uh, it seems like our government has uh, taken the right to to put the future of uh, next generations. Uh, for the benefit of today, meaning that it's it looks as if we have extremely, extremely short time preference, and uh, by getting the nation into debt, which is mathematically is not is not possible to return, no matter what we do. But uh, we know that there is no such thing as a free lunch, so some someone has to pay someday for this, and. Uh, not us, because we're, we're just kicking this can down the road, uh, no matter what, w which party. Uh, let's if we take take a look at deficits uh, for both parties, for uh, Republican presidents and Congresses and uh, Democratic. Uh, each president seems to be uh, doubling down on our debt, and now it's it becomes. How, where, where this system uh, got so wrong? So it 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 stepped into this uh, path of that seems no correction. For example, I know you mentioned that you don't like uh, terms like uniparty, but uh, if you look at at, uh, at the work and ideas of. Uh, such thinkers as as Menken, for example, uh, who was right making his his writing uh, almost hundred years ago, he was already asking a lot of questions about about the whole idea of democracy, and and uh, he had pretty good predictions about uh, uh, how it's going to be in, in in fifty years, for example, or. Current current thinkers like uh, David Stockman, for example, who was budget director uh, for a Reagan administration, so he he also uses uh, this term of uniparty. So, what is your view? How how do you see how we got to the point okay. where we are right now? And uh, without uh, let's say a revolution or uh, changing. Uh, or understanding what really went wrong. How can we fix anything? Okay, that's a lot of big questions. Um, so the first thing you said was, you know, what is the big problem? So maybe I should I should be more clear about that. So the problem is that we have two parties right now that on very many things act like their top priority is making the other party look bad. And they're not crazy in doing it. It's not just that they're uh, obsessed with this idea and it doesn't make any sense. They have the idea that what they really need to do is win the next election because we're in an unusual period in American history where the control of Congress has been very 
much sitting on a knife's edge where it could go either way almost every election. That's very unusual in American history. Usually we've had periods of dominance of one party for a long while. And sort of one party settles into the role as the governing party and the other party settles into a role as the minority party. That's not what we've had for the last 30 years here since, since 1994. Uh, and so both of these parties, the way that they control the congressional agenda, their number one priority is making the other party look bad. It's not solving the problems that we have, certainly not dealing with the debt because that's that's a tough, those are tough votes to take. They make people not so sure that they like you. They voted in the other guys at the next in, at the next election. So short time preference, as you said, it's a it's a very deep feature of, of the current mindset because somehow these parties both think that they're gonna make some big breakthrough and they're going to then finally get to do everything they want to do their way. Uh, but they keep, at the same time, not doing the kinds of things that they would need to do to win the support of a big majority of the American people and become a dominant majority party. It's kind of amazing to me how self-sabotaging each of our parties is today in terms of not doing the obvious things that they could do to expand their support. When you look at the presidential election we're likely to have next year, it's almost it's mind boggling uh, how neither neither one of these parties is doing the obvious things that it could do to have an easy big victory. Um, so, so why isn't the system self correcting? As you said, is, is, aren't we? Isn't that supposed to be the genius of of the Madisonian constitution and, and our machinery of government in America? And the thing to remember is. When we say self-correcting, the self is us, you know. Um, and I, I don't, I don't think that I share your sense that we, sh you know, Mencken and Mencken is a very despairing figure. As you say, he was writing. Most of his writings come from the 1920s, I think. Right. And so, for me, the fact that he was so despairing in the 1920s, and here we are, a hundred years later. It, is a reason to think that he was a little bit too much of a curmudgeon, uh, and um, and he got some things wrong. He he was a misanthrope, really. He he just loathed regular people, and I I would like to think more highly of the American people than than Mencken did, and to think that if the American people are able to have political parties that actually serve them, and do the kinds of things that they want. The American people actually want fairly sensible things. Um, but we're locked into this bad kind of equilibrium right now where the parties are not doing much of anything to take on our big problems. Like, I mean, you think about the southern border and it just seems so obvious that we need to do some big things. And Republicans who say we have a big emergency ought to be willing to do something that the president would be willing to sign on to, but they're much more interested in making him look bad and saying it's all his fault. Um, and that's a very unfortunate situation. Uh, so, yeah, ultimately the corrective needs to come from the voters to elect a different kind of person. I think I'm very sympathetic to people who think that we need to change the way we do primary elections in this country, that congressional primary elections are producing bad incentives today. Um, and, and we should think about different ways of doing them to produce different incentives. Um, so um, like, like the way Alaska is doing it now, where they, they run a big, a big primary for everybody of, of any party and then the top four candidates show up on the general election ballot. And then you rank your preferences of those four. That's the way Alaska is doing their elections now. I think there's a lot of good to come from, from experiments like that. Um, but, uh, you know, another question that, you're, that you raised, which I think is totally fair, is somehow if the government does so much for us, uh, are are we bound to have big problems? Are we bound to start um, abandoning our our ideals of of 
of limited government, of self-reliance. I, I share those concerns. Um, again, I, I think I think we shouldn't be too despairing. We It's not like we invented Social Security last week. It's almost 100 years old. Um, it's not like other countries that have universal health care are all becoming the playgrounds of tyrants. You know, I, I think I think when we think about maintaining a culture of political freedom, we shouldn't think of a big welfare state as necessarily incompatible with that. But I do think that there are some concerning trends. So like when I see this movement toward just like sending people checks in the mail ahead of elections to try to get their votes, that makes me very nervous. That seems like a... Um, not to be nasty about it, but that seems like a very South American kind of thing to do. And it is not so hard to imagine America's political system coming to resemble South American countries that have so much endemic corruption in them. Uh, that, that's my that's a real concern for me today. And so, yeah, both parties have a lot to answer for on that score in recent years. That's one of the things that concerned me most about Trump is that he was very excited about the idea of sending people checks. Um, okay, so, thank you very much for your for, for your answer. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, Laura. Yes, uh, Lev Levitin. Uh, Lev Levitin, you are known as the professor in my household. The professor. Really? <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Uh, you know, one thing, one kind of a joke or saying that I've heard from from not one, but uh, more than one uh, stand-up comedians is uh, they said the following. We had leaders like Jefferson and Madison, and now look, we have, and you know, you can put any names of uh, 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 this day politicians there, and what they do, you know, it depends on whom they want to talk about. Indeed, uh, you know, uh, don't, didn't it come to your mind or what you would think about an idea that we have a sort of degeneration, you know, degenerative development of what we call political class. The class of political, uh, the class of uh, professional politicians, so to speak. Look, look, what what happened? The most talented people, the most, you know, people with great mind and, and great soul, I would say, they uh, go to creative areas, science, technology, um, art maybe, and so on. Uh, some of them go into business too. Uh, like uh, Musk or Brin or people like that. Uh, but mostly uh, what the, the, the second escalon of people goes into business and they, they usually are successful in business and so on. And it turns out that uh, who actually goes into politics? Those are, you know, third level people, I would say. The people who look who they are, the mostly, uh, the, the education mostly is in uh, judiciary, you know, the uh, uh, jurisprudence, uh, anything, that, and even that is very limited, mostly only American system of laws and so on. They really, they do not know anything in economics, most of them. They do not know anything in uh, international uh, relationship and things like that. And the most, the, the worst thing that they do not know anything in technology and science, they cannot grasp the modern development of that and to understand what is an impact and to get prepared to that and so on. Oh, so, um, and this is a very bad thing. It turns out that we are ruled by people who are not the best people. I mean, the most intellectual, intellectually 
gifted people, uh, uh, people who uh, the you know the best can analyze and make this uh, uh, find solutions and make decisions and so on. But the third level, speaking intellectual, third level people. And uh, you know, it turns out that political class uh, becomes a class of people uh, whose only goal and only, um, how to say it, uh, the, the, the only business, so to speak, is uh, continue and propagate their existence as a ruling class, as political class. Uh, nothing else uh, is of, of their real interest. And uh, even that, even trying to keep the positions and so on, they are not so bright, even in that. So uh, then it is, you know, if we accept that view, of course, that, you know, that the, the, uh, resulting view is is very pessimistic of our future what would happen what can you can comment on that yes um so i think the first thing i will say is that the founding generation in america was indeed quite extraordinary and there was definitely a sense that the best people in the country were being drawn into this, into making this experiment. Uh, and it was, you know, they understood, they understood they were doing something great and historic uh, that would be talked about 200 years later. And um, that said, you, you only get to found a country once. Um, we, we shouldn't necessarily like in fact the opportunities in politics today do not match the ones in 1787 and so in some ways we we just can't expect all the top people to think that this is also exciting because there is a sense in which the patterns of our government are so well established and it's all going to be something of a grind and uh Maybe we don't really want our most creative people to be spending their time in politics. It sounds very healthy to me if they go invent things and make scientific discoveries instead of instead of worrying about how to slice up the pie. Um, so that's the first thing to say. The second thing to say is, you know, I think there's no question there are a lot of mediocrities in Congress now. But I, I nevertheless don't have quite as bleak of a view as you, as you, you just made it sound like uh, is warranted. Um, th there are a lot of very bright members of Congress, some of whom were very successful business people before they came, or, or very successful lawyers. I mean, you, you, you sort of made it sound like lawyers must not know very much, but that's historically in America our. Our legislators have been overwhelmingly drawn from from people with backgrounds in the law. That's that's just the traditional way in America. Um, and um, I I do think that we we've seen a lot of attrition of very good people in recent years um, because they don't like the way the place works, and so they 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 leave sooner than they might otherwise. Um, yeah, one member that comes to mind is the former Pennsylvania Senator Pat Toomey, who wasn't a young man. He must be in his early 70s or something. And he he retired and uh, the Republicans nominated this crazy, crazy person to replace him, uh, Dr. Oz, and uh, that, who a crazy person who lived in New Jersey, which the people in Pennsylvania didn't like so much. And so we got this strange Senator Fetterman that we have now in, in Sumi's chair, which is hard hard to say that's not degeneration, uh, let me tell you. 
<laughs> but uh, you know, I think in general, there still are a lot of smart, ambitious people who want to serve the country. Uh, again, I think the selection procedures we're using right now are not are not serving us very well. The kinds of people who can get the attention that lets them win the primary elections are often the ones with the worst tendencies. So this young woman from Colorado comes to mind, uh, Lauren Boebert. Uh, she knocked out a perfectly respectable incumbent Republican in a primary to get her seat. And uh, she's, she's a very lightweight person. Uh, so I think the part of the problem is that these lightweight people are the ones getting the most attention. And there's something wrong about our media system that's facilitating that. Uh, and I don't I don't know what to do about that. I do think that part of part of the era of social media is that, you know, the nature of virality in social media is creates just awful incentives in all kinds of institutions including science and technology, I would say, right? Um, so I don't know what to do about that. I, I, I agree that that does, I think, create a, a degenerative influence. But I think the good thing to say about it is that normal people are very sick of it. And that's that's the source of my hope to the extent I, I have it. And and even the, the, the smarter, the smarter, less famous members of Congress are very sick of it the ones you don't hear about as much so uh, part of part of the point of my book is to try to rouse these people to to fight for their for their own influence rather than allowing themselves to be pushed around uh, there should be no such people as, like professional politicians uh you know it could be some I, I i don't agree with that actually i mean Ted, Ted Kennedy was a career lifelong politician, of course, and uh, and a nasty a nasty human being in many ways. But he was a he was a healthy part of our political culture. Uh, he was a champion of of poor people. That wasn't that wasn't made up. Uh, he he fashioned himself. Uh, you know, I don't think he was the brightest person in the country, but. There, there's something to be said for professional politicians. Actually, I, I, I would prefer that politician not be a, a slur that we use to, to, uh, disparage people. I would prefer that it, we understand that there, there is a, an importance and and dignity to this calling. Uh, even if there are some unsavory aspects to the work, even under the best circumstances. So. Uh, another question. Oh, okay, um, Anya. <clears throat> um, okay, hi. Um, that was very interesting. Uh, so thank you. Uh, and one of the thoughts that um I was very interested in is, well, which sounded very simple. Um, I understand that the reality is much more complex. Uh, that they're more interested in like. Not black, blackmail in another, but to presenting each other parties, are presenting each other in a bad light. That's one of the thoughts that you express, and um, I'm sort of interested in whatever social groups and if if we can uh, see like um, Republican senators and Democratic senators as a group, they should be like more moderate, more far left, more far right in that respect. So if we think about it like, like as a political spectrum, then who is interested in presenting the other party in bad light? Everybody or more, or still more people on the far left and far right? Or would you ascribe this as a tendency to more or less everybody except the most moderate members of every party? If it's clear, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, no, it's a good question. Um, I think that, yes, I think that people to the farther left and farther right are the main, the main offenders. Um, not to say the only ones, 
but uh, right. I and and you know part of this is a geography problem. Uh, we actually have more districts in this country that are very very intensely one way or the other than we did in the past. There's been a sorting of people by view in, in in into these views and so that just that means to some extent some of these members are faithfully reflecting their constituents so it's not it's not just that they've come up with this strange idea that nobody likes it's that in some cases this is what they're this is they 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 cor they correctly or at least reasonably conclude that this is what their constituents really want so the famous young woman from New York, right, Miss Ocasio Cortez, uh, you know, very far left, but she's probably not wrong to think that the people in her district really like this show that she's putting on. Uh, very quick, no, I understand. Very quick follow up question then. Do you think that uh, this politicization, like m m f farther part of districts, is due to like real politicization, real like um, further and further apart, or gerrymandering, or both? I think gerrymandering makes it all a little worse. But it's not like the main cause because we still see these problems in the Senate. Right. It's not just the House. We have these problems in the Senate, and the Senate is not gerrymandered. And so uh I think I think getting rid of gerrymandering would make things a little better. It would make there be a, some more purple districts, right? Where we have actual competitive general elections. That would be good. I would like to see more neutral district drawing instead of partisan district drawing, but I don't think that would solve the problem um, very thoroughly. It would help, but... Um, but that's know, not the major cause. Yeah, I, I think, again, part of the question is just like, why are these voices elevated so much? Media? Not and I and in this particular respect, I don't mean social, uh, social media. I mean just media. Yeah. Well, of course, you know, if you go back sixty years in American media, we had three television channels on every, you know, in everyone's household, and those were the choices, and everyone tuned into them, and they were all very sort of middle of the road, because that was what the economics of that media market demanded. And then we got, you know, talk radio kind of grew up in opposition to that and created a space for right-wing dissenters. And then we got Fox News and MSNBC and and now we got social media, you know, and eight gazillion websites that, and new TV channels that are even farther out to the edges. And so, uh, yeah, I think, um, I think that is a big part of the story, and and I don't I don't know what to do about that. Um, right. Thank you. Okay. Okay, Michael, please. Okay. Thank you. Uh, well, thanks for the enlightening presentation, but I'll take a different tap in this discussion. So bear with me. Now, I also analyzed some of your presentations of a few years ago, knowing that you know every book, and you just came out with the book, is a result of ideas that were hatched many years before the book came out. And in particular, um, I spent some time, and you probably know this, you remember this conference on October 16, 2020, with four or five of your colleagues, where you were presenting uh, the, your solutions. Uh, but you don't have to remember, I, I'll, I'll just remind you of that. So, so for the purpose of this discussion, I agree with the description of problems in need of cure, even though it seemed to me that this session was more like a gripe session rather than a, a, a disciplined 
approach to what we're going to do. And, and, and so my comments shouldn't be taken as criticizing uh, your book, and I'm not. And I don't criticize anyone if I don't have my own solutions or don't know better solutions, and I don't. So it seems that the Congress uh, was the most successful in reforming itself because that's what you seem to lay priority on. It's, it's got to reform itself. And, and it was the most successful when it fought an outside adversary, so to speak adversary. Usually it was the executive power. And uh, so all parties in Congress benefited from the change. Uh, sometimes it, it didn't fight, but it kind of got together and to fight for more staff, for more money, uh, you emphasized it in your discussions for creation of the Congressional Budget Office, the Office of Technology Assessment. You know, goodies, some of them good, that were good for the entire Congress. Things break when one party will benefit more than the other. And so to remove as much as possible my own political preferences, uh, you know, I do have ones. I'm relatively conservative. So I, I analyze the problem as a management one. Here is the problem. What can we do? What should we do? Now, I'll remove the joke that was here about studios. And we can get back to you, <laughs> to this. Um, so here is a set of, in a set of incentives driving the congressman. And let's see how we can affect the incentives to change their behavior, because that's what you want. Yes, 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 yes. The incentives are not a mystery. They're like everybody else. And I will limit them as many parameters in, in, in complex systems uh, to five. The incentives are more of wealth, fame, power, for some, service of God, for some, service of the people, in different proportions for different congressmen. And some incentives they talk incessantly about, and some incentives, well, they pretend that they don't exist, but they do. And, I, you know, one can have a very long discussion about incentives, you know, sex, security, sense of security, as in more sex, more security, um, are also incentives. And, you know, philosophers spent 2,000 years, and no one, to, to my knowledge, came up with an independent system. And mathematicians understand what I'm saying, but you don't have to be a mathematician. So, uh, as you know, some incentives may be considered more senior to the incentives that I have postulated. But I'm not going to go through this. We'll never solve this. So, I'll give three examples of problems besetting the Congress now. And it's not my own examples. They are kind of lifted from what you were saying. They're also my own. Well, they spend too much time, they mean in Congress, raising money. A solution, remove the bloody incentive, impose term limits so that the last term is spent productively. We'll discuss that every solution I don't consider a, a, an excellent one. This is social science. We can discuss forever how imposing, what negative effects imposing term limits have. But at least we start with the incentives and we follow through to see what solutions we can um, try to catch. 
money raised by the congressman skews their judgment. Well, remove money from the politics to the degree possible. And now we're dealing with the First Amendment. There are many, and you discussed it in this session and before, there are too many safe seats leading to the polarization because the seats are safe and extremism on both sides, left and right. We, we can work on the system, and you mentioned too, uh, I think Alaska, uh, where the redistricting is completely eliminated and we're moving to more toward um, statewide voting. So that's not meant to be a speech. I'm coming up to my questions. So needless to add, all these require, and additional examples that I admitted, would require changes in the Constitution. And from my reading, and obviously not in the last few days, but reading your stuff, it seems that in your area of research, it's considered being naive to suggest changes of the Constitution for obvious reasons. Takes forever, never gets done, so why propose? And uh, so the questions are, is that the case in your mind? Because I'm just guessing what you are thinking when you research. Is that why none of the solutions that you have proposed, as much as I could gather, uh, uh, didn't require change of constitutions? Some of them were what would be nice if uh, not not Thank you. Thank you. One more question. Close to the point. Okay. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. Please close to the point. Please uh, formulate it. So, so other than the changes that benefited the entire Congress, and we discussed them, do you have examples where Congress made changes, serious changes, where changes impaired the interests of Congress? Okay. Okay. Uh, well, let me start with this question about changing the Constitution. Uh, I, I think that what you said is is right. Basically, that when I when I think about uh, you know, there's a long tradition of of intellectuals. In America, who say our whole separation of power system is is rotten, and we really need to switch to a parliamentary system. Uh, there have been people saying that for 150 years. It's never once gotten any traction in American practical politics. It's it's never had any meaningful support amongst the electorate, and um, so to my mind, it does seem a little bit just academic to to talk about ideas like I don't know whether America would be a better place if we had a, a parliamentary system of government where we had a prime minister elected by the legislature and a and a collapse of the distinction between the legislature and the executive that's a very different system of government we're not actually going to make that experiment we're not going to do it so it's it's, it's it becomes just an intellectual exercise to talk about whether it would be a good idea or not. And it doesn't interest me that much. In my opinion, we need to value our own political inheritance that has come down to us. I don't think that it's fundamentally faulty or defective or or uh, predestining us to uh, degeneration and ruin. I don't I don't think any of those things. So I think it's worth figuring out how to make it work. And I take heart from the fact that Congress has renewed itself in the past. Our political system has not just been 
one way and going on a steady trend forever. We have we 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 see these moments of uh of of ferment of reform and I don't see why we can't have another one uh in in the present. I, I don't see anything about America like I I these questions about bad incentives from the media structure certainly do seem a little bit unique to the present moment, but I don't see them as insufferable. Um, so uh, that is sort of my general orientation is that, yeah, that, that's how I see my my job is to think about how to make our own political inheritance work. Uh, and if that's intellectually unambitious to you, I, I don't know. It, it doesn't seem that way to me. Uh, so uh, you raise some concrete problems and, and potential solutions. Um, you talked about, yeah, yeah, this interesting idea of what can Congress do that's just good for the whole institution. And I, yeah, I, I have talked about that in the past and um, admire the creation of the Congressional Budget Office, especially that's an intensely impressive organization that has endured through the decades now, coming up on 50 years now. Uh, it serves both parties. It, it helps Congress have its own capacity to think about the budget, it does great work. I, I really admire it. And uh, we should work on that. So I have the proposal to create a congressional regulation office that would help that would help congressmen of, uh, in a nonpartisan way understand our different regulatory regimes and, and think about uh, how well they're working and uh, think about the cost and benef costs and benefits of, of proposed regulations. I'm enthusiastic about that kind of idea. And it it, it does have a, a little bit of interest on Capitol Hill. Uh, so I, I, I try on that front. I think it's it's worth it's worth trying. Uh, so now your other one. So yeah, I, I'm worried that congressmen spend too much time raising money. That's if they could all sign some sort of disarmament treaty where they would all just agree not to spend so much time raising money. I feel like it would make their lives so much better and it would uh it would make it would make our congress so much better. Uh you can see why unilateral disarmament is not appealing to any side and why the arms race continues. Um so yeah, if we could figure out some rule to to sort of create bilateral disarmament on that front, I, I would be enthusiastic about it. I've become worried about these small donors who who create this sort of national constituency that any member can decide to play for uh, and, and totally overwhelm the influence of their own district-based constituents. So, um, you know, with the First Amendment being what it is, I, I don't know that it's possible to just stop people's ability to, to to make political contributions, but maybe we need to figure out ways of amplifying the influence of people's own locally geographically based constituencies. Um, I think New York City actually has some kind of program like that, uh, where they're sort of matching funds to plus up contrib contributions from, from local people, in-district people. Too many safe seats, yeah, redistricting, um, it's it's a healthy thing. There's a lot of people who spend their careers trying to push that. I, I don't think uh, it's so important for me to spend my time doing that, but I am in, I'm basically, basically supportive of it. Uh, a, a, a solution that I haven't talked much about tonight, but I think is very important is, is getting committees to be centers of policy making in these institutions. I think that sh fundamentally shifts the incentives for members and rewards them for putting in the time to become experts in a subject. If their work in a committee actually leads to legislation to actual influence such that, you know, their desire for for power and or service of the good or service of the people actually ends up being expressed in lawmaking and not just in speechifying. So the problem we have today it goes along with this top-down leadership problem is that committees, no matter how much time they spend working on a bipartisan bill, very fine uh, 
investment in, in making sure they get things right, they actually don't have any guarantee that it's going to be brought to the floor and voted on. Uh, and the speaker has been sort of the absolute gatekeeper. And if it's not politically convenient to put this bill on the floor, uh, the speaker is not going to do it as, as a general rule. You know, there are plenty of exceptions, but that's the general dynamic. I would like to find ways of changing the rules to make it guaranteed that committees can get their bills to the floor, at least their big priority bills that their members have put in a lot of work on. I think that would shift the incentives such that you could be sure that if you put in the work on the legislation that that actually results in a in something meaningful happening instead of just putting in all that work and having it lead to nothing. I think that's the that's the problem we have with committees right now is that members are reasonably uh, worried that committee work just doesn't go anywhere. So I'd like to change that dynamic. And I, I've been advancing some rules changes that would support that. That's why some of what's happening in the House in 2023 is a little bit intriguing and exciting to me is that some of some of the folks who pressure McCarthy are saying things like this, um, but I, I I'm not I'm not quite sure if their hearts are really in it uh, or whether there will be much follow through. Um, and McCarthy himself is is certainly not going to be the one who's going to advance these interests. He would like to be as much of a Nancy Pelosi like speaker as he could. Um, so, um, so the book, the book is meant to, as a spur to action for people who are ambitious people in Congress who would like to change their own, change the incentives of the institution to reward people like them. Uh, that, that's the idea. I, I do think there's kind of a tendency among political scribblers to say, oh, if I write down my 17 point plan, then that's going to be the way to fix everything. Um, and I'm I'm not actually the biggest enthusiast of 17 point plans because I I realize that it's not up to me in the end. I realize that to get this kind of change, there has to be a culture shift on Capitol Hill itself that the members want to make their institution work differently. I believe that that's not uh, that's not a pie in the sky idea because I I believe from talking to members that a lot of them are very dissatisfied with how things are today. So that's my source of hope. Um, and uh, I don't know if that satisfies your 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 very uh, prosecutorial questions, but I, I hope I hope a little bit. Okay, thank you. Your uh, host. First of all, I would like to thank you, which I did not do, you know, in the beginning. Uh, first time, I would like to thank you for your brilliant presentation. Indeed, you know, very clear, very informative you know we learned a lot from you and it was very important that uh, we hear it from a person who actually actively participated in you know in doing some politics after all you know trying to change the political landscape in a way uh now my question is you know um i spent uh, almost half of my time under in the Soviet Union, first under Stalin regime, and then uh, after the, the Stalin's, you know, the <clears throat> uh, people who follow him, all that. So uh, I myself and many people like me, you know, who are from the Soviet Union, and here you have all of them from the Soviet Union, actually. Uh, some of them uh, left it uh, when it was already not Soviet Union, but most probably have a Soviet experience of life under totalitarian regime. So we are very sensitive to any, uh, you know, least flavor of totalitarianism, the, the smallest signs of, of uh, totalitarian or even authoritarian regime, the, the uh, you know, the danger of that makes us really very concerned, right? And, uh, you know, I think I would express opinion of a number of people who are here now today and of many other people 
who feel that uh, this country is, you know, hard to say it, on, on that on that terrible way, so to speak, that, uh, you know, we can feel in the atmosphere how the atmosphere becomes, it's changing and becomes uh, dangerous. Uh, you know, and the danger is to to go into a sort of a, a sort of a totalitarian regime. Uh, it does not matter what is the ideology, what is the ideological dress of that. The important point is the, is the, uh, the, the meaning of that, you know, the essence of that regime, which uh, uh, when uh, the state or the government, the state, what it represents the state, uh, determines uh, all uh, all the details of the private life of the individual. The individual, the rights of the individual actually become just illusory, you know, the, no real rights. Everything is under control. Um, information, uh, economics, uh, whatever, right? All the parts, including, of course, politics and so on. There's a very dangerous path. And what do you think about that? I, I know that Americans usually do not believe us when many of them do not believe us and they say it, they say no. Then you are talking about something that, you know, cannot happen in this country. But, you know, uh, unfortunately, history tells us that it may happen in in well-developed and civilized countries like it happened in, in Germany, for example, uh, between the First and the Second World War, and so on. Okay, I, I would like to hear to you now. Thank you for the question. I will say that, you know, I'm, I'm 40 years old, and I started... Uh, dating my wife when I was 20 years old. And that's when I got to know Nona and Jana. So Jana was in my life for 20, half of my life, the, the adult half of my life. And they, they've been very important figures in shaping my own political outlook and, and very much along, along the lines that you just described. So this is very important to me and, and to thinking about the future of what America is all about for my, for my daughters, um, for, Jean, for Jean's great-granddaughters. Uh, and uh, I do think for, for me, the free politics is, is the essence of it. And the idea that you have to you have to let your opponents have their say, and defeat them through persuasion, or 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 raw or numbers, I suppose, Over, overwhelming numbers, I guess, is, is respectable enough. But uh, you uh, you have to actually beat them instead of just shoving them out of the picture, <clears throat> somehow suppressing them and saying these people are not worthy to participate in politics. I think that's that's a trend that that worries me the most is how much both sides are really eager <clears throat> to make this move to say I don't have to persuade my opponents because they they don't belong here they're not real Americans or they're fascists or whatever there, there's there's a lot of different kinds of moves that we have they're homophobic transphobic racist right all these different moves to try to just get people out of the discussion entirely and um <clears throat> to me that's very that's very contrary to the american tradition of politics the american tradition of politics is that you actually have to persuade people you have to meet them where they are <clears throat> however however ugly you may think their starting point is however wrong headed you might believe them to be and you need to you need to work work it out 
figure out how you can talk to them, meet them where they stand. And so I think um, I think we're not we're 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 getting worse and worse at that, and that that concerns me. I I don't think it's totally bleak. I don't think it's um. I don't think it's hopeless. I I'm I guess I'm I'm a little optimistic on the optimistic side about whether sort of whether we've reached peak peak wokeness such that you know shoving people out of politics because you say that they have some you know wrong-headed bigoted opinion and that disqualifies them I, I think that's not as powerful today as it was a few years ago and I, I hope it will become less powerful still I, I I think it's fine to argue against someone's position and to say that you think that they're coming from the wrong place and are trying to do the wrong thing but it's not okay to just try to completely marginalize them and, and say that their kind of person needs to be pushed out of politics. So that's that's very central to why I think having a having a vital Congress is important. Uh, you know, I, 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 I think it's very to me, it's very important to realize that we can't we can't vindicate this American political tradition just by having some some president come in and throw punches at the at the right people. I, I you know, I think I, I think amongst people who are big fans of, of President Trump, I think that some of them do a lot of magical thinking about how he's going to cast out the bad people or vindicate vindicate the right people and that's somehow going to set everything right. I, I I think Trump's uh, style of of doing politics, unfortunately, tends to make this problem worse, uh, and, and that's why I am not I'm not myself a fan of him. Even if even if I think people who are trying to sabotage him <laughs> commit so many offenses of their own uh, in trying trying to go against him, which are also a serious source of concern. Uh, so, uh, I, I, I do, I do think those are the stakes. Um, I'm, I'm glad you, I'm glad you raised them. I, I think, I think that's how I think about things too. I do think the future of, of freedom is at stake when we think about the future of Congress. I don't think that's very intuitive for most people. I think most people think of Congress as a big waste of time, uh, and so this is part of what I'm proselytizing with my book is to try to make people understand that that this tradition of political freedom is is something we have to vindicate in in every new generation uh lest lest it lest it go go away and leave us with a much uh a much scarier political world. Thank you. Okay, Mark, please. Yes, I want to ask you a specific question. Imagine you are a member of Congress. How would you vote about giving zillions of dollars to Ukraine? Well, I will preface my answer by saying that I consider myself a rank dilettante when it comes to all matters of, of foreign policy. Uh, I I have my opinions, and I I'm willing to share them with you, but I I don't want you to think that I think of myself as any kind of expert on these matters. So having made that remark, I think that I would be fairly supportive of giving zillions of dollars to Ukraine because I think it is reasonable to think of, of Russia as a geopolitical foe. And I think that this is a relatively good return on investment uh, in, in, a, in weakening Russia to have them fighting with Ukraine. And I think the Ukrainian people have shown that they're willing to take our dollars and make serious use of them, along with stealing some of them. I have no doubt that that's part of the bargain. 
think anybody who <laughs> imagined differently would just be a little crazy. But uh, I think nevertheless, it's a, it's a pretty good return on our investment. And um, that's my, that's my amateur opinion, but I really, I really do think it's um, not something I know very much about. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Boris. I have a couple of questions. And first, I want to say thank you for a very uh, beautiful lecture. Uh, my question is, um, previously, it seems to me, <laughs> I didn't learn here, I, I hear only 30 years. Previously, it seems to me that uh, previously politician was a uh, club of gentlemen. And they uh, had uh, education which was pretty close to each other and uh, uh, some habits and uh, so they understand better each other. Just now uh, uh, in many cases uh, they are uh, have a different uh, uh, history uh, and uh, because of it uh, they even don't want to hear each other. Yes, uh, I, I think there's a lot of truth to that. Um... You know, there, there's a word that used to be used to describe the Senate in particular. The word is comity, C-O-M-I-T-Y. And the value of comity was extremely important to these senators. And that meant, according each of the other members of this august body, very great dignity. And the, the sense that all of them needed to be treated as as do very great respect because of the solemn nature of their office and because of their membership in this political class of gentlemen as as you put it uh, i i think that was i i have to admit that i have a certain degree of nostalgia for the the senate of the 1950s it is is very much characterized by this dynamic and i believe there really is something excellent about it um that, that we've that we've mostly lost track of today um i think to me the a, a bigger part of the problem i i still think there's a lot of hope even if people don't see themselves as part of this gentlemanly class and maybe there's just no chance of bringing that back i still think it's possible for people to think of themselves as part of a common project of doing what's right for the united states of america i i think that that's a very vague notion, and precisely because of its vagueness, it allows a lot of different people to get behind it, and and I think it's a serviceable way of, of thinking, and I don't think it's dead. I still think a lot of people in government do, do really be believe those terms. Um, but I am worried, I'm worried by the rise of a lot of members who don't think that that project is worthwhile who explicitly think America is a rotten place. And I will say that that's, that's now present on the right as well as the left. There, there's, there's this growing contingent on the right who seems to think that that sort of liberalism in, in small L sense is, is maybe just a bad idea and America's political institutions are rotten and and maybe we need to do things completely differently if we ever have any hope of getting our act together. And I, obviously there's plenty of people on the left who think America is a racist imperial nation and deserves nothing but misery. And that really worries, the growing size of that really worries me. Because I have been, to get back to Lev's question, you know, when you, I've been reading a lot about Weimar Germany and the rise of the Nazis, how did this happen? And a, a, a really remarkable feature of that political body is how many members of of the Reichstag were members of the Reichstag who openly had just open contempt for the institution they were a part of. And the idea of free politics and, and liberal liberal adjudication of, of different competing values. They just openly thought that that was all nonsense and all terrible, right? And that was the communists on the left and the Nazis on the right. And uh, 
eventually by the time you got to 1930 you had a majority of the members of the of the parliament who were anti-parliamentary in their orientation and and were happy to see this place smashed to pieces and um you know of course weimar had none of the historical roots that america does right there's no long tradition we we're coming up on 250 years of 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 being a free a free people and i think that that goes a long way actually uh in anchor in anchoring us but but to the extent that we have growing factions of people who are willing to say that they're not really for the american project i i think i think i i would just like to drum those you know those, those people have obviously have their voice i i just made a speech before about not pushing people out of politics entirely so i guess i can't say that i want to push them out entirely but i i, I those those are the people who scare me the most those are the people that it's most important to counter in my mind um I have a follow-up follow -up question. I mean, yeah. this. Um, so uh, it seems to me that American system of government governing was to create such institu institution that uh, people should come to some solution together. And yeah. because, because of it, they make uh, this rather complex system. And I was very worried when uh, filibuster was limited in, uh, it seems to me, about 2014. And uh, I see that that's like end of the project in some way. Uh, well, yeah, reading about the Senate of old, it's amazing how important it was as part of this principle of comity that they had a right of unlimited debate. Yes. They, the filibuster, the word filibuster is a term of abuse, really. That's how the defenders of the old tradition like to put it, that they they believed in the right of unlimited debate and that if a member was willing to keep standing there and trying to convince his colleagues or something, well, by God, we had to let him. That's what it meant to be a free people with with representatives accorded the full respect that they're due. And uh, and I, I believe that there's something very attractive about that tradition and about the filibuster as it traditionally operated. Um, and unfortunately, today we don't have any big debates with our filibusters. It's just a vote threshold, right? It's just sixty votes. Yeah, it doesn't, if, if you, focus, it doesn't focus the mind. It doesn't it doesn't force us to have the arguments. It's just a vote threshold. It, All things considered, I would rather have the vote threshold than not have it. I think it. It's healthy, and I'm glad Senator Manchin and Senator Cinema helped make sure that it survived. I th I think we ought to salute them for that. Uh, but I would like to see the filibuster be something more lively, something that actually brought a sense that we were engaged in trying to persuade each other or showing showing the uh, the passion of our convictions through the act of 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 actually debating. And so I, I like these ideas. There's some amount of reform ideas for the revival of the talking filibuster. And I, I'm enthusiastic ab about those. But yeah, I, 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 you know, there's an awful lot of reformist types who think that democracy, you know, rendered as 50% plus one getting their way on everything all the time is the most important value in the world. And I say that's, it's a value. It's it's part of our political tradition, but it's only a part of it, and it's not meant to override all the other parts. And we oughtn't treat it as 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 the defining characteristic of our political system because it's not meant to be. So that's that's, that's yes. Thank you. It's, it's, it's very many uh, signs of disagreement and uh, absence of uh, desire to come to some solution. Simply, people shove some decision by any force, and uh, they don't care what what yeah. happened after the six. You know, it uh, they don't understand that better to keep walls, but not go to another room by any means. Yeah. Uh, thank, thank you again. I mean, and it creates a very vicious cycle, right? 
you know, you were right. In 2014, the Democrats got rid of the filibuster for the executive appointments. In 2017, the Republicans got rid of it for the Supreme Court. It, and, you know, it, it's a tit for tat. And yes. who, how do you how do you stop the, the cycle? It's 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 not easy. Yeah, thank you again. Okay, Ilya, Ilya, my question. Yeah, we can't hear you, sorry. Ilya, microphone. Uh, first of all, thank you for very informative presentation. Thank you. Uh, as majority, I believe the audience agreed that America is on continuous decline. To me, even on accelerated decline. And I know that you're optimistic and you think that it's reversible. According to history and uh, sociology, if you wish, any empire, and America is economical empire, has a beginning, rise, plateau, and failure. And uh, if you know, there is a there was a Scottish historian, 18th century uh, Scottish Scottish historian and thinker, uh, Alexander Titler. Uh, he is uh, notorious for stating that uh, any democracy is only temporary, it cannot sustain itself. And um, freedom has cycles. So would you share this concept? Uh, would you say that America is an exclusion from this uh, laws or history? What is the, what is your take on it? I, I I think that there's probably a lot of truth to that, but the time scales are very large, and I don't think it's predetermined where in the cycle we are. Um, so if you asked me if if America is likely to be a a country we would recognize as a free country in 250 more years i i don't know it it's there's there's plenty of reasons to doubt uh but i don't know i'm not going to live that long so i'm going to try to do my part to to be not in the worst part of the cycle today and uh that's that's sort of what i take to be the the meaning of patriotism i suppose <laughs> okay in, and uh yeah it's easy to be it's easy to be gloomy uh there's there's a lot of decadence right so a sign of sign of declining empire is decadence right so i i i think there are a lot of signs of that but uh there's a lot of exciting things and uh there's a lot of life in this country yet i think so I, I don't think it's predetermined. And, um, you know, the Rome, Roman Republic lasted for 500 years. So we've, we may have some run, we may have some run yet. I, um, no, I, there is I, a I, I, suppose, I suppose it really, it is a dispositional matter to some extent. I, I don't see, I, you know, there's a good line that What's what's the angle in pessimism? <laughs> you know? No, no, I, I understand. I understand that, but this decline has been lasting for so long, right? And we don't see really cor correct. I understand optimism. I like to be optimistic. Also, I'm living in this country more than half of my life. Right? So uh, I'd like to be optimistic, but I don't see any <laughs> supportive events, if you wish, for that. If we extrapolate what is going on right now, right? I don't see it. I don't know. I mean, we, we, we're, we've we gone through a period of, I, I would say, 
a little uh, some some sort of technological stagnation where we weren't making so many really big exciting new things happening other than the internet right but i don't know we may be coming out of that i think there are reasons for for optimism i think that what's happening with with artificial intelligence is very exciting. Um, I think, you know, who knows? Maybe we'll get nuclear fusion. I, I, who, I think, I think there's a lot of exciting things happening in America today. Thank uh, you. Okay. 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 Thank you, Rana. Please, Rana. comment i totally disagree describing uh, Weimar republic as a communist on the left and hitler's party on the right hitler's party is also on the left it's a socialist party only with national flavor but totally socialist and the state that hitler was successfully building and built at some point was people's state it wasn't some no reactionary rightist state. It was all for people with the government telling people what to do in exactly the same style as in the Soviet Union. If you look even at the posters, they're so similar. It was very stupid for them to quarrel. They were meant for each other and both of them were on the left and there was nobody on the right. I just I think that you're wrong, Nona. I I think uh, the the Nazis flirted with socialist economics because it had certain electoral advantages. Uh, but the fact that they like to expropriate people doesn't make them real real socialist by any means. Uh, and their constituency was a right wing constituency. They were in. They were in league with these right wing, right wing national party who were sort of based in the mili military background. They're, the kind of opposition they had to Weimar Republic was was rightist. They, they did they did not talk about they, they talked about bringing back the Kaiser to some extent. That was something they flirted with while they were rising. But it was all about, you know, so they have certain family resemblances totalitarian regimes do. I, I think that there are a lot of commonalities uh, in the way that they manipulate their people. I don't I don't doubt that that's true. But uh, hatred of the communists really was Hitler's animating way of making sense of the world from the time he was a very young man. He, that, that that was his whole political lodestar. So the idea that they could have gotten along and been friends, I, I mean, uh, it, it it totally goes against what 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 Hitler felt himself to be all about. Um, and I don't I don't think it I don't think it was a posture. That's how he made sense of the world. Forget about friends. He was wrong on that, but he was wrong. Uh, he enjoyed real people's support. And the state that he built was quite beneficial for German people, not for some aristocrats. And the ideologically, ideologically, it was built as a leftist state, very much government controlling life of every single citizen and resident and subject and telling what to do and government, of course, knowing what's best and organizing social services. They were great of that. And education, Hitler Rugen, it was great. And well, it was all well, very, very leftist. Yeah, it's it's not exactly the, the state, right? It's the party. They, 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 they use the party to colonize every aspect of, of, of life. Uh, yes. But I, I, I guess I just don't see that as inherently left wing. Uh, it's, it's certainly the opposite of libertarian, if that's what you think right wing means. But, but I don't know. Libertarianism is is not like a, a great historical force. Let's say it's 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 a, 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 a 
an idea that that's always attracted a certain part of uh, the intellectual world. But right, right parties are not. I mean, if you look at Bismarck, do you think Bismarck was a socialist? No, Bismarck was. Bismarck a was great at building social services too. He was a man of the right. This was an established political tradition in Germany. That... Nobody argues that Bismarck was on the right, but he was so intelligent and so remarkable that it doesn't really matter. <laughs> thank you. Okay, okay, thank you. Uh, Michael, please. Misha, microphone, microphone, please. I would like to support Jana because, first of all, historically Hitler was far left, not just left, far left. It, 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 there are uh, historical facts that he was uh, uh, attending the meeting after uh, Jewish uh, commun communist died, and he was attending the funeral with the red ribbon. So. When you read his works, he rejects capitalism, he hates banking, he uh, wants state unions, which is cal calking from Soviet Union. He, I, I, the only difference was nationalism. So, of course, if you look at Soviet Union, Stalin uh, at some point started advocating uh, Russian nationalism, so absolutely no difference. After World War II, Stalin, even there's some uh, records, he was trying to do his own Holocaust, which didn't end well for him. So Hitler and Stalin and communists in general were like uh, bloods and creeps. Bloods are bandits, creeps are bandits. Fighting each other, killing each other doesn't mean the opposite. They are sharing the same ideology. And uh, what what I also would like, uh, we're looking for the problems with Congress, with um, American politics. Uh, for example, people lionizing uh, Ted Kennedy. Again, he, he was using social demagoguery. He said he wants to help the poor. So did Hitler. And unlike Kennedy, he did help poor. He, he defeated poverty in Germany. What was the price? Uh, remember Borking. Borking itself, to me, it was fa he was acting like a fascist. And he destroyed a good man. And that's it. So. That if we have to stop lionizing bad people, bad people are bad politicians. Well, I I think the Ted Spen, Ted Kennedy speech against Bork is 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 one of the most dishonorable acts uh, in recent political history, uh, and and a part of creating this very bad cycle. Yeah, that's what we're yeah doing now. Yep. It, so that I, I'm in complete agreement with you on that. And I, I'm in complete agreement that I do not like Ted Kennedy's policy, policies that he was going for. But nevertheless, I think we ought to be able to appreciate that he was, in fact, the kind of legislator that people in the political opposition knew that they could try to work with. I think that's so important to realize that what it means to make this Congress work is that people who fundamentally suspect that the other people are bad people are nevertheless able to find ways of working together. I agree. So uh, that that's to the that's how I'm wanting to lionize Ted Kennedy, and I I agree that he his, his actually yeah, I mean they, I I think I you know I think I think Ted Kennedy okay let's leave Ted Kennedy there uh, you know. I, I, I would, I it's, would a like to... it's a fascist tactics strategy. She, she just, uh, you know, forced people to do what she wanted. And again, they say, oh, she's a fish. This is fascism. We, we're, we're normalizing 
things that should be if if we keep normalizing it we lose the count. I I don't agree that 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 that's fascism. No, um, I mean having having super disciplined political parties that make all of their members march in line is not incompatible with you, you free, vote free for, for the you vote for the for the bill before you read it. What is not it is it's not fascism. So you you I don't need you to understand what you would just vote for this. This is fascism to me, and this it seems efficient. I I think that it is true that not knowing what's in the bills, that's that's that's, a, that's the nature of her. Like he, I, I I honestly don't. I think you could overdo it with that one. I think uh, these kinds of deals made by the leaders and sort of they they tell their members about them through their staff. They rely on certain relationships of trust. I, I, I wouldn't overdo that one, to be honest. It's manipulation. Okay. It, it, is, it is manipulation. That's true. I think a certain amount of manipulation is, is inevitable. Leaders are going to use carrots and sticks to try to discipline their members. That's a normal part of party politics. We shouldn't, we shouldn't get, we shouldn't get to the idea that somehow vigorously contested party politics is is fascist that that would be that would be wrong it's okay to have strong political competition it's okay to have people who want to beat the other side but it's not okay for that to be the only priority that's what that's my point because if if you if you vote without reading this, this is this is not you're not defeating you you just no i think that's just a that's just a case of showing trust in the people who put the bill together. Okay. And I don't know that that's necessarily yeah, such we, a terrible we, thing. We trust our Führer, so that's <laughs> it. Yes, if you have a whole legislative apparatus that essentially gives no scrutiny to laws before they get put in effect, that is that is really bad. But I don't know that it, these sort of read the bill complaints are, are necessarily a good, a good instance of that. Uh, that's what I would say. So you you think if if they repeat something like that, it's still okay? It's not killing the democracy. I, I I'm not saying it's okay. I, I'm just saying I don't share your impulse to say this is this is the 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 sharp end of the stick of authoritarianism that's getting in under our under our door. I, I think that's a little over dramatic. I think the members the members can can fight these things out th th themselves and. Um, you know how big of an abuse it is in any given situation may 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 depend on the context. I I agree with pro the professor that being born in the Soviet Union, we're we're like canaries. We are more sensitive to this. I I think when you agree with us, it would be too late. Yep, exactly. Okay, um, Michael, is China a fascist state? To China. to much extent, yes. Yes, to a large extent. I, I guess I just don't know what the word fascist is is doing for you at that point. It's it's sort of a soft totalitarian state, but I don't know what's the word fascist doing doing there. I, I, I fascism has a specific historical meaning. I don't I don't think yeah. calling Chinese yeah, it's, it's leftism and corporatism. We have corporatism now. Look at high tech. They're 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 very closely that's that's what we have now corporations are supporting the left mussolini was number two in a socialist party he realized he's not going to be number one he created his own party well, the difference was nationalism and corporatism and and he won yeah okay let's let's go further Let's go to your opinion. You know, Philip, I, I believe that uh, here we we come to the we have come to the um, root of uh, uh, differences in our Weltanschauung, as uh, German people say, world outlook in a way. You know, English translation is not very good. The point is that. For me, the whole story of mankind 
is a story of a struggle between two tendencies. The first tendency is a subjugation of an individual to external power. It may be a power of, of the mm, uh, tribe, power of, of, of you know, the um, uh, pastors or whatever, uh, you know, okay. the power, uh, power of state. This is one tendency. Uh, and the opposite tendency, a uh, tendency to maximize the emancipation of the individual, to maxi ma maximize the sphere of individual freedoms, independence uh, of individual of, of the um, any power, any external power, and all that. There are only two such poles, two poles, not any three pole like, uh, like, you know, extreme left, extreme right, and something in between. No, but one, once somebody said that they would like to be, they don't want to be extreme right and extreme left, and that what it meant, they meant by extreme left, something like Soviet Union, and extreme right, something like, like uh, Nazi Germany. So I said, and you believe to be centrist, what does it mean? You want to put me in the middle between Stalin and Hitler, right in the middle, in that place, you know. So uh, in my opinion, it is all wrong. Left and right are terminology taken from the past when it made sense in a way, you know, but uh, it doesn't make sense right now from that point of view. There are only two different tendencies and two great forces which working in the opposite directions. The tendency to a totalitarian regime that may be whatever. A totalitarian regime can be based on, on uh, the idea of uh, um, struggle of classes or, or the idea of uh, national, uh, how to say it is, uh, Superiority, also. yeah, yeah, and uh, or theocracy, pure theocracy, like in Iran, and it is all the same. You can call it left, right, but does not matter. It's all, it, it is all uh, totalitarian regimes, and the opposite, the different degrees of freedom, democracy. Democracy is not as some people say; it's a power of the majority. No. The, you know very well, better than I maybe, that if you write down the full de definition of democracy, it would be, you know, about uh, one and a half uh, pages of small script, you know, written in small, by small font, all that, you know. It means a lot of different things, including the modern understanding of what is a democracy. And uh, uh, all of the all of those are necessary elements of the democracy. By the way, um, a separation of powers, which is the idea of Montesquieu, is also a necessary part. And and the European countries, uh, at some point, they have it. At some point, they have at least partial um, separation of powers, like judicial and and. Uh, and government and uh, parliament. Uh, anyway, uh, what uh, and many other things, you know, uh, um, local, uh, um, how to say, self self ruling, local, municipal, and so on. It's also part of that. So many different features. Uh, so uh, I don't know, but uh, you know, I have a feeling that that you do not uh, share this point of view, that there are these two poles, uh, uh, totalitarianism on one side and maximum freedom on the other side. I uh, do not share that view. You are correct. And you believe that there are, the picture is more complex. Yes. Uh, 
I start with Aristotle, who says man is a political animal. And living in societies and trying to have well-ordered societies is, is an eternal problem of man. And the idea that you could somehow live in a society where you just had the predomination of this tendency toward freedom or liberation seems like a total dream to me. I, I don't know where it would come from to have social order that gives that gives freedom uh, the chance to flourish requi yeah. requires requires government requires collective action and I, I don't think so so the idea of of the state exerting power at all is not necessarily ominous to me. Now, the potential for tyranny is eternal. And, uh, you know, I think a great part of the American political tradition is, is, a, is a special terror of, of tyranny. It's sort of built into the country's political DNA. And I think that's extremely healthy. And so... The, the people whose instinct is just to sort of hate all government exercise of power. I, I think they're playing a, a useful role in our political system, in our political culture. But I don't think that they're, but I don't wish that they would just prevail and somehow uh, set us all free by smashing all government power, because I actually think that would leave us with anarchy. I think when you go back to the American founding, your position sounds very much like the anti-federalists to me. They they were the ones most intensely worried about concentrations of government power in any kind at all. They thought that Washington D.C. was well. Washington D.C. wasn't there then. They thought that the national capital, which of course first was in New York and then Philadelphia, they thought that the capital was bound to become a corrupt den of thieves. And. Uh, that, that it was all going to go in a very bad direction. Uh, and the Federalists had the better argument, to my mind. They, they, they're the one that built this country that has done so much good in the history of the world. Uh, and they had to do it by building a, a, a truly powerful central government to go along with our layers of federalism. Uh, so I, I think when I was... Uh, I've become less of a libertarian and more of a conservative in my own political development. And my understanding of conservatism is this idea that that social order is is an all is an achievement that's always in danger. And we can't just we can't just think that if we fight back against the power of the state that that will that liberation will come. Because uh, uh, I, I think I think that that's um, I don't know I don't know where in the history of the world uh, that 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 tendency left to itself led led to order. But actually, that is what is if you if you take the American Constitution, as it is with all this, all the mm, amendments and all that, you know, then you have, a, you know, if somebody reads it, uh, without looking at the political practice of, especially the last century, the, you know, the last, uh, this century, you know, he would say that this is close to that ideal. Because uh, again, I'm not saying that at this at this stage of social development, I would say that government is is uh, something uh, which is absolutely bad. Uh, uh, though, for example, Reagan it was was one who, who liked this it's expression that government government is a, is the problem itself. It's not the solution for the problem you know, and things like that. 
but I'm, I'm not saying that the government is bad and it should be eliminated. The role of the government is exactly that. It should be a guarantor of those individual rights and freedoms. Uh, for, for example, uh, excess, uh, you know, when you exercise individual rights and freedoms in the area of economics, that would lead to monopolization, to, you know, uh, appearance of uh, monopoly of large corporations, which would prevent um, progress and development and uh, lead to a sort of exploitation and, and things like that. And government should prevent it. Government should have this anti-monopolistic laws and all that, right? I agree with that, absolutely. What I'm speaking is, is very clear. The government should not try to, to control individual freedoms. It's, it's different. It should not control information, for example. It should, it shouldn't, uh, and, uh, should not control um, private business except the, the except it should prevent from this monopolization and so on so uh, government should not be an alternative to a free market Gov government should have as its it's one of the major goals is preservation of free market it should that it really will remain free well i'm i'm in complete agreement with you on that huh? i agree yes I, I that's 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 what my uh my place of business is all about is is figuring out how to help government secure the free market. But you realize that left and right are two directions which actually you know come together. It's like they they go around and come together because it's all totalitarianism and we don't have to you know much to distinguish between them. It's all forms of totalitarianism that should be, we should fight against them. We should fight against them. Absolutely. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. I guess we, there are no more questions and, and statements. Probably we will we'll finish for today. Uh, Philip, if Philip wants to say some conclusions, some it's up to him. If if you want to, oh, I I don't think I have any big conclusion, but I just want to thank you for having me. Uh, th this is um this has really been a great a great pleasure and honor to to talk with you all. And as as I said before, I really. I like to think that I've taken on some some part of the the experience of surviving the Soviet Union that is part of my own uh, family's history now, and 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 made it part of a, a a central part of how I make sense of the world. So I, I hope that uh, in spite of whatever differences we have, you may you can. Uh, appreciate that and anyhow I, I really I'm very grateful for the opportunity to have have the chance to speak to you all Thank I would prefer oh, to see you one more time I, I see that Leonid wants to say something Leonid? Yeah. I want to say a special thank you for making us a club of professors I'm really pleased to hear it thank you very much okay thank you all right thank you guys Thank you, Philip. Thank you, everybody. It was very interesting. Uh, yeah, I'd like to say that certainly you have uh, much more to the interesting things to tell us uh, because what today's talk was about actually the current situation. You know. Yes. Well, go, uh, maybe, go. I, maybe I can come back in a while and, and give you an update. Yeah. Very good. Very good. Thank you. Okay. So, yeah, yeah. I believe what what was important. That's probably the first time we we have a politician here <laughs> in, in our club because that's um, um, most of us technical, mathematical, you know. And I just called myself like this. Well, I wanted to say about multidimensionality about this. Well, let's say 
one dimension, well, here we have uh, freedom, here we have uh, no freedom, but uh, well, you said that there, there are some other dimensionality. It would be interesting, well, to speak about what are the other dimensionality, if you want to describe this. For sure, it's more complex, but that's Lev just said about the most important thing. Right, right. I, I would like really that you would visit us again and again. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. Okay. And I, I had other questions to ask, you know, that's uh, but I always uh, waited, 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 and now it's okay. Fine. Well, it's easy to find my email if you if you want to look for it. I'm happy to. Yeah, just please come uh, to okay. to ask you if you want to say about anything actually. Okay. Yeah, they, because it would be different eyes. Well, you see different eyes because no one views at uh, the situation like you view. You know. Yes, and yeah, I, I want I want to say uh, that um, well, well, people say that politician is uh, is something. It, it's a bad word. Uh, I, I I don't think so. It's not necessary. Well. I, I look at you and <laughs> what I see is a good politician because uh, you're young, nice looking. I mean, nice looking in the sense, pleasant, pleasant person. Uh, someone who people trust, you know, and uh, you, you actually have a good chance to make political career. I don't know what, what do you want to do in the future? Yeah, but... Um, uh, do, do, do you want to take? Do, do you want to become a president of the United States? No, I don't have the skill set for that. I'm afraid. <laughs> but you have time. You know, you have you have eighty year, forty years more. You know, for training. <laughs> Come on, Biden sure. proved that anybody can have sure, sure. skills well, for that. Well, well, definitely, definitely. Okay. Well, thank you. Okay. Again. Well, anyway, it was a very pleasant experience. Thank you very much. All right. Thank, thank you. you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. All the best.